speaking to the urban and rural characteristics of New Tecumseh, because this is not just a singular place. It's made up of different settlements and communities, both in an urban and a rural uh, context. The, the aims and objectives of an urban design guideline we can define in, in four basic ways. One is to make it as simple as possible, so that it's graphic, it's visual, it's easy to understand, and we're also speaking to multiple audiences. audiences. This is for uh, the proponent who's bringing a project forward. It's for members of the public to understand the aspirations of the town as well as the decision makers and staff who are reviewing and, and approving documents. It needs to be flexible. It's not just about locking into a moment in time. Uh, this is a document that is meant for use by everybody. So it's a reference document first. So we need to make sure that's easy to use and navigate and, and update as your policies change and evolve over time. Promoting design excellence is an absolute must. We need to demonstrate how to make the best possible built environment within New Tecumseh. We also need to advance the town's vision. That you write a lot of policy documents, you approve them, they set out an idea and a vision for what you want to become. This document is in support of all of those efforts. There are four basic parts to a successful guide in our experience. So we state the principle. What is it that we're trying to achieve? We include inspirational text and elaboration. We provide examples either through graphics or using photographs to describe what that particular element is all about. And we can include prescription, um, but not always. So prescription would be a, a, a strict number, uh, defining something um, that you have to achieve that. Otherwise, we leave it fairly open um, and, and allow some flexibility within how people make use of the guide. So what we've heard so far in going out to the public and in our staff working group and our community and stakeholder meetings is varied, but there are some consistent messages that are coming through this. So a real interest in complete streets and active transportation and walkability as being primary ways to build out New Tecumseh and, and uh, retrofit what's there today. Uh, mobility was certainly a big issue with, with everybody. Um, that trees and greening, sustainability, the environment are critical for people. They want to make sure that New Tecumseh is promoting the, the, the best of what you have today and uh, improving into the future. Um, that the um, connectivity is a big deal. People really want to not depend on their car all the time. And we know that that is a big challenge and a big ask, but you have these lovely settlements that are walkable. How can you extract that same qualities that you find in your um, historic pre-war settlements and translate that to your newer places as well? So as part of the phase one work, we developed a needs assessment report, and there are really 10 priority areas that we want to focus on within the content of the guidelines. First, it's about reinforcing, elaborating, and supplementing your policy that you have in place. Approaching the public realm first, because from this, everything else starts to uh, flow out of that. So walkability, bikeability, uh, transit supportive. Taking a principle-based approach. And what that means is that there is flexibility in how you apply a principle. It doesn't mean that there's only one way to achieve it. So it allows some um, latitude with the developer or the designer or uh, the city in how they achieve that particular uh, principle. Making New Tecumseh a healthy and complete community at all scales. Uh, this is a really important aspect of this. This is not just about how a building looks. It's about building places that are active, that are healthy, that people want to walk around and from that, we start to create places that are what we call complete. So if you have uh, the ability to walk to their school, you have ability to walk to your medical facility um, to, to get fresh fruit and groceries, that is what contributes to making a healthy and complete place. A greater emphasis on equity. And this is obviously is, is a, an absolute uh, necessity, making sure that you are responding to the needs of all people who live 
and work within New Tecumseh. Greater emphasis on climate responses. So how do we deal with that in the public realm and within the building design as well? Um, the elephant in the room, we know that this is an issue everywhere. I've never worked anywhere where people say we have enough parking. But how do we uh, uh, make sure that we are addressing parking within the design of our communities in a responsible way? so that it's not making it more difficult to achieve everything else that you set out to do within your official plan. Promoting and encouraging the missing middle. So not relying on single family and detached and, and semi-detached homes as the primary built form within uh, New Tecumseh. We know that there are growth targets that you have to achieve. So how are you gonna do that with the broadest range of building types? We do know that long or tall buildings are part of your future, along with mid-rise and everything in between um, the, the single family low density and those building types. So how do we mitigate the impact of those within your communities? Um, also, this issue of how long the buildings are. There have been some applications that we've seen that challenge the length of uh, what is acceptable. So how do we start to um, articulate those buildings in such a way that we have them contribute in a positive way. And then again, this issue about what is prescriptive and what is flexible. So we need to balance that through the content of the guide. I do want to make this point about um, what urban design is and what it's not. So in our opinion, urban design is not about aesthetics. It's about how a building performs and how it contributes to and improving the quality of life of people. So, um, and that, that's broad. So the quality of, of opportunity and economic growth. This is what we mean by urban design. This is not about the color of a building. It's not about what the materials are. It's about how it performs and contributes to the sense of comfort that people have primarily walking around. So when we start from the perspective of pedestrian, the slowest possible mover within the built environment, then we can satisfy all of the others. So uh, to define a healthy and complete community, there are these um, six characteristics uh, of built form, street design, proximity, how close are you to things, the mix of uses, land use, um, that's not really an issue that we're going to address as part of this, that, that's part of your zoning and, and your official plan, but it is something that we will uh, address with the, the types of, of buildings that we speak to. The quality or the design excellence of these spaces, and then connectivity. The guidelines themselves are set up to move from um, a large scale, so talking about the broader community and then we get into the details as we move through the guide. So within the introduction of the guide we talk about the official plan, the TMP, the, the provincial goals, the, the growth plan, uh, anything that addresses it from an aspirational perspective. Then we define context. What is the place that we're working within? It's not about just taking something from someplace else. It's about an understanding of what's here today and what you would like it to become. Then we work through the three scales of community, site, and building design um, and, and talk about what are the qualities that we want at each of those that will contribute to the whole. Uh, and then uh, wrapping up with some recommendations around implementation. So with that, before we get into uh, a description of what the content will start to include, maybe we could uh, stop it there and ask if, any, if there are any questions that you have. No, thank you. It's very informative so far. I appreciate that. Are there any questions for members of council so far? Councillor Foster. Um, thank you, Mayor Norcross, through you to the deputant. I think it was back on page one, you, you used the term complete streets. I'm just curious if you could expand on exactly what that is. I'd love to. Um, this is one of my areas of... Um, it's one of my passions, actually. So complete streets is um, it's pretty much a marketing term that was developed in 2006 by a group out of the United States called Smart Growth America. But what they were trying to do was in, um, encapsulate the idea about creating safe, equitable, and accessible places that 
um, considered the needs of all of the various users of a street. Um, for the past century, the focus has been on one user over all others, and that's the private automobile. And that has led to a lot of issues. So if you think of how our cities developed pre-war, um, it was a very different type of structure. Um, the scale of places was different. They were based around the pedestrian and then streetcar um, usage. Um, but after the war, there was this entire movement to designing streets as, basically as plumbing. We thought of arterials, collector roads, local roads. It was almost like the big pipe, little pipe, smaller pipe. And a lot of the same engineering principles were applied to both. What's been happening, though, in reaction to that over the last 40, 50 years has been trying to uncover what is it that makes that so bad for us uh, as, as places? And I think we, we see that. We see how difficult it is to institute a transit system in a place like New Tech. Um, you don't have the density around transit stops to have the frequency in which to provide a reliable service that's really going to make a dent in your, um, your, your roadway, you know, making that shift from cars to other uses, uh, just as an example. So what Complete Streets tries to do is say, well, we're going to place pedestrians and the vulnerable user at the top of the hierarchy. And we're going to make sure that everything that we do is providing safe and equitable transportation for everybody. Um, there are other users here. It's not just about mobility as well. Uh, streets are also places for water movement and, and drainage. So we need to deal with green infrastructure and street trees and those things, because they will contribute to uh, the quality of the public realm and making it more um, interesting for people and comfortable and inviting for them to choose to move around in a different way than their cars. So it's part of the equation. It, it's not going to solve all the problems. It's part of the overall puzzle for making better places. Uh, thank you. That's a lot to unpackage <laughs> in a short period of time. Um, just one other. I just like to just put something out there because I think, and maybe you'll address it throughout. Over over my own term of of council, it seems as if there have been an awful lot of times where um, the staff have, have put in something to council, and questions have come up about the urban design guidelines. And I think one thing that I personally would like to see um, resolved in this is so that everybody was moving in lockstep is that what what was happening when the development came because when you have when you have staff putting in a report it's well intentioned they've done a lot of background work and then when they see resistance or, or appear to what might appear as resistance that just causes confusion frustration lack of understanding so will a document like this in your opinion give clarity so that, that that issue of of the entire development process through to to completion will will be much smoother and, and, and will leave really no no room for discernment of, of what you're putting in. You know what I, I think you understand what I'm asking? Mm -hmm. That that is the intent that it makes it clearer for everybody who's involved um, about what is anticipated. We are meeting with uh, representatives of the development community. They are contributing to um, all of this. And, and so we're hearing what they have, what, what, what their issues are, and how we might be able to develop a guide that is useful to them as well. Um, your particular question around streets, I don't know if, if that was the, the no, in intro, the intro to that. Are, is, are they connected, or are they? Well, I think it's all connected. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The the um, that that certainly is our intent to try to make it as clear as possible to all various users what's intended um, with the guide. Okay. One quick last question. Just on your list of priorities, you you, you uh, I asked you a question and you referred to we're meeting with developers. Whoa. Rank rank the the town staff development. And the residents in an order of priority, or do you treat them all equally, or you look at their opinions all equally? Yeah, that that's a that's a great question. So we're not decision makers. We provide a professional opinion, 
And um, in the writing of the guide, we consider all feedback that we receive from any particular group to inform that opinion. But um, it doesn't mean that if someone says something, that's what we believe should become part of the guide. It helps to inform it. So that's, it really is up to you as decision makers to um, accept the recommendation that we're making. Um, so there is no rank, I would say. Everything is, is treated as input to the process. Thank you. I might have won the 15 minute city. Seems to be, it's, it's becoming very popular. It's gaining a lot, of, um, mm -hmm. a lot of traction and it makes a lot of sense when you read the documents. Yeah. Are you incorporating that into the urban design guidelines going forward or is that a separate process? So again, like Complete Streets, the 15 minute city is a marketing term. To think about how did we do things before the advent of the automobile, because so much of, of the, the impact of planning entirely for one user is that you plan for one user and that's who succeeds. Um, but if you think of what um, any place built before the advent of the car, and there are thousands of years of city development before that time, they were compact, they were walkable, they were 15 minute cities, just as, as a result of not thinking about a motorized user. So um, when we get into this, you'll see that we are pulling in some not 15 minute city ideas, but um, similar thoughts to the new urbanist um, movement from the, um, the United States and Canada, which started back in the 1970s. But it was rooted in this idea of how did we plan things before the pre-war system? Um, a lot of what was done in Ontario before the war you go to any small town and um, that largely developed before that time that has now become the city core is entirely walkable. You go to Guelph, you go to um, Alliston, you go to um, Collingwood, all those places that had a settlement before was done in such a way that everything you needed was within a, a, a comfortable, convenient walking distance. So we're trying to instill that same thinking here. How could we um, ensure that development in the future? I mean, obviously, you're not trying to recreate something. We're not trying to be nostalgic. We're trying to take the qualities of those places that were walkable and therefore sustainable. Uh, mm. And those are the things that you're talking about in your official plan as part of and your team. No, I get that. Maybe I didn't explain myself properly. Yeah. I guess what I'm saying is when the more I study the 15-minute city and the concept is that everything you need for a healthy happy life is is achievable within 15 minutes of a of a walk or a bicycle ride yeah so they're saying when you're doing your urban design guidelines and you're talking about the functionality of buildings and what can be placed i guess that's something we'd have to go through our zoning bylaw mm -hmm. because you're right when we when you look at subdivisions and stuff like that they they just carry on and there's yeah. no way to transverse from mm -hmm. uh, those subdivisions to get all the amenities that you would need within 15 minutes so right anyhow okay i just thought i'd clarify myself yeah so. mr mayor if i can and yeah, thanks please. for for clarifying it, within the the guideline document you you look at the third section community design that's where we start getting into that scale of thinking uh, we'll, we'll talk about how do you, if you have, a, say, a large tract of land that you're taking through a subdivision process, how could you establish that in such a way that you promote walkability to um, make sure that everything that you need is, is in close proximity? So, oh, yes. Thank, thank you. you. Any other questions of Council? Councillor Rappin? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so just following up on the couple of the ideas that have been for, brought forward, I have two things. The complete streets. Uh, do you have um, an a, example somewhere I can go and check check a, a high graded complete street somewhere in Canada or Ontario? Well, ideally, uh, Ontario, southwestern Ontario, but uh, somewhere where I could go and say, "Wow, I really understand what you're talking about, and this this is pretty pretty awesome." Or do we have something that's approaching it in our own township? Um, and then uh, I'll just go with the other question, then you take your time answering however you want. And the other one was um, when um, Councillor Foster was talking about um, where the ideas are coming from and, 
and whether they're ranked or priority, that kind of thing. And then the report was going to be made. Is there a way for me to discern where the ideas come from? Um, a developer's idea has a different um, intended result, I would imagine, than than a resident's idea. Do you know what I mean? So, like for me, if it's my idea, it's because I just want to get reelected, right? I'm kidding, YouTube. I'm kidding, but uh, but a developer's, you know. Possi possibly profit, maybe not, but possibly profit. So is there a way when we get the, the report, am I able to say, well, that was a resident's idea. That was a developer's idea. Will you, will you delineate or let me know which ones are which? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. So yeah, there are thousands of complete street examples in Ontario. And there are uh, dozens of complete street guides and policies for municipalities of various scales across the, uh, the the country, so that that's not a hard thing to to share with you. Um, one of the first in Ontario is in St. Thomas, so this was back back in um, the the late 2000s, early 2010s. Um, but we've we've prepared guidelines for a lot of various cities around the GTA, so it that there are a lot of of um, that, that's an easy one. The, the one about whose idea is what. Um, we do have a public engagement consultant who is part of our team and all of the meetings that we have with um, through the engagement process are part of the public record. So there is a summary report of engagement activities that outlines all of the key messages. Now we don't rank the key messages we don't say, oh, 25 people showed up at a meeting and they all were promoting this one thing. Uh, therefore, that's the most important. We don't, we don't kind of play that game because a lot of people think that you stack the deck and you're going to get the outcome. So it, we don't, we don't um, subscribe to that form of engagement. It's about we listen and we see where, um, where things align with the policy. Now, um, this is a tool for development of communities. So obviously the, the development community is um, going to want a, uh, to understand this tool and what it means for them. But if your policies are suggesting in your official plan, in your TMP, in your community plans, a particular direction, this helps to supplement it. This doesn't set the course. This is def uh, refining what you've already said within your policies. So that's where it lies within the spectrum. We have provincial and regional policy. You have your municipal policy directions. The guidelines really follow that. Thank you. Thank you. Carry on, please. OK. So now we'll, we'll get in a little bit to talk about the content of the guide. And we haven't written this yet. We're just giving a, a bit of a preview about the, the types of elements within it. So within chapter one is where we define the vision and the purpose of the guideline document, how it's organized, the policy background that helps to give direction to it, and how to use the guideline document. So it's a, it's a simple introduction. And chapter two is where we start to talk about context. So here we will describe the one town, three unique communities, um, that define New Tecumseh. And then we use a tool called the Rural to Urban Transect. Um, and then we'll describe how to use this transect as a framework for defining the intensity and development of the different places within New Tech. So if you're not familiar with this, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time uh, describing what this tool is. Uh, this was developed by the, the Congress for New Urbanism to speak to the different types of places that uh, new tech actually has. You have your rural areas and urban. And going from the, the less intense natural places to the most um, built up intense places with the highest number of people, that there are a lot of similarities from a principal perspective that you're trying to achieve within each of these different areas. And I'll, and I'll spend a little bit of time speaking to that. 
Now, in New Tecumseh, when you apply this transect, you actually already have this within your official plan, but you don't name it as such. You talk to the less urban areas, like the natural and rural, and then you move to the more urban, being your urban settlement areas and the edge suburban and your centers. So you have already established a policy framework that fits within this transect idea. And it's useful for us as a tool to organize the guidelines, talk about the different building types and the context in which they reside. So when we start to apply this transect to these four primary um, uh, context types that you have here, you can start to see how the buildings and the open spaces transition from the natural, where you have smaller buildings with more open space around them, to moving towards the more urban areas in your centers where it's more building and the open space is shaped and framed differently. In chapter three, we talk about the community design, so the structure and identity of the place, the parks, trails, and public spaces, the street network design, and how all of that informs the block design. Then we move into complete streets and provide more detail around that. Spending a little bit more time in this section, we'll talk about our draft principles for each of these. So for community structure and identity, the principle is to respect and reinforce the existing and planned context. So it's not just about looking backwards, it's about looking forwards as well. So that could apply to your historic town centers, your new residential areas, as well as your commercial and industrial areas. All of these are important places within new, te new tech. For parks, trails, and open spaces, the principle here is to locate and design the parks to create new focal points and enhance connectivity to larger natural heritage and greenway systems. What often happens is that open space and parks are the leftover spaces after the developers have carved up their site. And what they give you is the hazard land or the part that's not terribly attractive for putting houses and other buildings. So we want to make sure that parks have a positive and meaningful contribution to new development, as well as retrofits in your existing communities. For street network design, it's about designing well-connected streets that promote permeability and accessibility and accommodate a variety of lot sizes. So here's an example from a guideline that we did for the, the town of Richmond Hill that describes the distinction between what we refer to as the pre-war or the, the post-war conventional grid on the, excuse me, on the left, where you have your arterials, collectors, local roads, very difficult for anyone other than a vehicle to navigate the space in an efficient way. So how do we translate that and take a similar sized um, development, uh, introduce a different type of street and linkage network to make it more attractive to walking and biking? You break down the scale of that. And in block design, again, we're trying to promote walkability as the first choice for moving around. It shouldn't be the last choice. So we can look at different guidelines and, and how they um, represent, how do you make a difference? So a lot of this is connected to block length. It's about having connections so that you have choices for about moving about. It's not about having just one choice, but multiple different routes for how you move through a place. And then lastly, complete street design. Design streets that are safe. That's the primary objective around complete streets, making them safe for the vulnerable user, uh, making sure they're comfortable, inviting, equitable, and beautiful. So there's, a, yes, a lot to unpack in that one principle, but that's what we're trying to achieve. Moving down to this next scale, we talk about the site. So we consider the context in which that site exists, the placement of buildings on that site, how they orient to the buildings next to them, as well as this, the primary street on which they have an address. Adjacent relationships, so this is where we talk a lot about transition, uh, whether it's to other buildings or land uses or parks and open spaces. Uh, heritage is, is part of this conversation. Site circulation and parking, landscape design, uh, loading, servicing, and utilities, 
environment friendly, so talking about the sustainability aspects of the site, and then signage. So an example, and again we'll go through each of these, uh, a principle for um, uh, considering the context is to respect and respond to new text built and natural environment. It's not just about built heritage, it's about uh, the natural context as well. So what are the qualities of new buildings that um, we need to understand um, and, and how they fit within the uh, characteristics of the existing buildings? The placement of buildings on a site, so locate and orient buildings to define and enhance, again, the pedestrian environment. What's going to contribute to making it a inviting and comfortable walkable place? Adjacent relationships, establishing that transition of building scale to adjacent neighborhoods, parks, open spaces, and natural heritage areas. Heritage, ensure that the cultural significance of heritage resources are maintained over time. For site circulation and parking, we want to minimize the visual and functional impact of access and parking and servicing on the public realm. Landscape design, design privately owned but publicly accessible open space. And again, th these are, this is landscape on sites. Um, it could apply to um, what happens on uh, publicly owned sites as well. But design them in such a way that they are part of the larger pedestrian environment and contributing to a sense of place and improved ecological function. And you will see more and more privately owned public spaces coming with more intense development. That is uh, certainly one of the outcomes of Bill 23 and the reduction in open space that can be asked of, um, of developers as part of larger projects. Loading, servicing, and utilities. So integrate these uses as well as utilities into the overall site plan and architecture of the project, so minimizing their impact. Design new buildings and sites to improve overall environmental performance and prioritize sustainability. For signage and wayfinding, design wayfinding that is intuitive, consistent, concise, and enhances the character of its surroundings. Then we move down to the building scale. And um, this is where we take on the bulk of, of the overall guide. This will be the largest segment or section of, of the overall document. And we go through all of these various building types. So within this fir first phase uh, of our guideline development, we're gonna focus on these four building typologies. The, the low rise residential, the mid rise, the high rise, and then the commercial and retail design. The uh, fifth and sixth typologies we will address um, next. So the rural development to support the agri-food network and the adaptive reuse sections. So uh, this presentation will just introduce the first four. There are a lot of different building types that fall in the low-rise residential category. We have the singles and the semi-detached. We have the tri and quadplexes, townhouses and live work. In the mid-rise residential, this is where we'll find the block townhouses or stack townhouses and the apartment buildings. So within your official plan, you have defined the maximum heights for these different building types, both the low-rise and the mid-rise. And then high-rise residential, these could either be a standalone tall building or having a taller element above a podium or a base building. Um, this you see most often in areas that have an existing um, urban context where you're relating the base building to the, uh, the buildings that are adjacent to it or in a new area that you're trying to create a stronger pedestrian relationship. Within your official plan, a tall building is defined as anything above six stories. But in your zoning, six to 12 stories is the definition. So. Um, sorry, six stories up to 20 meters, and then the, official, the zoning says six to 12 stories, so 36 meters in height. 
And then for the commercial and retail, there are a lot of other categories as well. You have your traditional Main Street infill that happens. You have greenfield development. Uh, you have your malls and large commercial retail plaza infill and redevelopment. We're seeing both throughout, the, uh, throughout southern Ontario. And then drive-throughs. How do we make the best possible um, drive-through? Because that is still a type that we'll, we will uh, experience in new tech for, for some time. So that is the presentation. We did have some questions to prompt you on this, but you're, of course, welcome to an ask anything you would like. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the council. I'll just go around the horseshoe. Councillor Biss. Uh, thank, thank you, Worship. Um, through your Worship, is it, is it, what's your first name again? Brent. Brent. Yes. Okay, I just wasn't sure. People, I just wasn't listening right, I just, so I may have written them down wrong. So Brent, um, through, the, through your Worship to Brent, a couple questions. I mean, well, you know, obviously, um, I wasn't on council, I guess, when the uh, previous uh, statement of work was created, and they selected uh, your your team. But one thing that you mentioned was uh, the three communities. Um, I'll just have you look at the wall there. There are actually four communities that came when mm -hmm. we when New Tecumseh amalgamated. One of them was the town of Tecumseh. Right. Um, it was it's a rural farming agricultural foundation. I traditionally call it the the quiet contributors, mm -hmm. not only to our economy but to our culture. So I was just a little disappointed that we didn't get to 5.5 discussing agribusiness and storage, et cetera, because that is one of the four most important groups in our community. Mm -hmm. um, I was just impressed upon you that the, when, when you're looking at that, like I said, it is one of the four pillars that created our community mm -hmm. and probably the, the largest economic contributor next to automotive also in our community. Right. So it's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, also, another three of worship, just uh, also want to point out is we, we've had this discussion before where we have uh, certain communities, new communities that have done a great job at um, bringing in trails and pathways, doing that cross-sectional, mm -hmm. um, like you mentioned, being able to go through a community and, and get access to a community through trails and pathways. What we typically don't actually see, though, and I think we've experienced it, especially this winter, is that trails and pathways generally are not maintained at the same level as roads and sidewalks. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, how do you, how would you be able to um, monetize or allow us to understand the costs associated with trails and pathways so that they can be accessible 365 days a year? So first, thank you for the correction. Um, by no means are we ignoring the agri-food. We will address it, but thank you for, for stating the importance of that. Monetizing um, the impact of the trails network. So in Complete Streets, we talk a lot about the overall network. It's the, it's the complete network. And in places that already have existing pedestrian trails and, and connections, that's an important part of it. So we're not saying get rid of it. It's part of it. But don't ignore your streets. Your streets should be the primary means in which people walk and bike around a community. Therefore, it's a little easier to maintain because you, you haven't extended the network to take on something else. Um, we won't address maintenance too much within this, um, but in complete streets work, we all, we're always trying to promote. If you're out there plowing the roads, you should also be identifying what are the bike routes and the pedestrian routes that you need to prioritize as well. Most places say arterial roads, we're going to plow them when there's this much snow or salt them when there's this much snow and local streets will get last. What's the hierarchy of the pedestrian network? So you might think about things like, where's the school? How am I going to get children safely to school? Where are um, the senior facilities? Um, how can they get to a, a transit stop if that is um, something that they, they use for getting around because they don't drive further? And as new tech it is, a community with a lot of seniors in it, um, there will be time when people are no longer able to drive. So how comfortable can they move about? And you need to start developing a maintenance plan that considers the vulnerable user, not just the roadway user. Um, it's a difficult thing. You have a large geography. So, um, but th those are, are things that you can start to talk about. Um, I would say that the trail systems are important but not at the expense of the street network. 
for pedestrian and cycling movement. They should be a supplement to, they should not necessarily default to becoming the primary way that you're going to satisfy pedestrian movement. Um, and we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit in chapter three within the community design um, part of it. Uh, thank you, Brent. Um, through your worship to Brent, one other question because, you know, have you, have you reviewed our multimodal transportation? And so, mm -hmm. does it, I mean, is this something that also forms a foundation of your recommendations? Yes, okay. it's part of the, the policy background. Oh. Along the, yes, so the TMP, the official plan, any of the, the current policies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Best. Is there any other questions or comments from members of Council? Councillor Foster. Thank you, Mayor Norcross. To you, to Brent. Um, the one question, well, actually, there's two questions. One was you had commented about existing policies, and, and so would we assume that your recommendations will suggest changes to potential changes to existing policy um, or note that it complements the existing? That's sort of one question. And then the second question is. Where does the MCR and um, play into all of the county MCR play into all of your urban design guidelines? And as a specific example, if you, if you, in reading the report, there's been a, I would say, over the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of proposals come before this council that have worked to expand and build three, four more communities not connected to it. In the last while, I think we've seen a move towards um, expanding the existing settlement boundaries, which seems to be what what ultimately is going to happen. So that's where the MCR plays into all this. So how does that interact with with what you're creating? Is really the question, along with the other two about the existing policies. Thanks, Councillor. I'll I'll answer the first part um, of that, and then maybe I'll ask. Madeline or Jennifer to assist with the MCR review aspect of it, but uh, I'll start. So um, the policy that you have, we're not suggesting um, necessarily changing it. We'll, we'll see how we work within that first, but there will be recommendations that we make about possible actions um, that, that might help assist in the implementation of the design guidelines. Some of that may be policy change for you to consider, but um, this this is not a policy changing document. We're not going to suggest the OP needs to get modified necessarily. Often what happens is that we may suggest some um, changes to zoning um, if we see that is, is something that is uh, possible. It might be future work, uh, a, a study that may not um, currently exist or a policy that doesn't currently exist with within the town um, but for the most part it does work within and you have a lot of updated policies so that's really helpful um, quite recent efforts so we're, we're fortunate for that for the MCR review I'll, I'll say that the region has been participating in the process uh, they've been um, contributing to the, the stakeholder meetings um, but maybe Madeline, you can speak to that in more detail. Through you, Mayor, to Councillor Foster. Thank you, Brent. Uh, it's a great question. So as Brent had mentioned, so the County of Simcoe, they do participate in our um, public information sessions and our stakeholder sessions. We also have reached out to local school boards uh, as well as our um, local health regional network um, because we think it's really important to hear all the perspectives because we do know that we're going to grow significantly uh, through the MCR work and when we put together the RFP for the development of these new guidelines that was really at the crux of it. Uh, we want to be sure that we're developing a set of guidelines that can help staff and council and the community navigate through the different types of built form and community structures that we are will inevitably start seeing in our community as we grow. We wanted to be sure the document uh, is flexible, but also leaves us uh, with some clear guidance so we can be sure that we're sort of not left without questions or gray area when we deal with some higher density projects that I know we've already seen come before council's table. So 
the population growth is, is a huge part of what's going to make these guidelines so successful. We're anticipating that these guidelines will stretch over to those, you know, 30 years and be sure that we're creating successful communities. Thank you, Madeline. Any other comments or questions for members of council? Councilor Cox. Thank you, Susan Mayor, um, to the speaker. Um, is there opportunities in these guidelines to promote design based on the existing natural spaces that we have rather than trying to incorporate nature um, after the fact, even specifically in new development? It absolutely speaks to that. So how, um, when we talked about community design and the need for parks and open space to become part of central elements within new development, that that's part of it so um, expanding upon existing natural features is is a critical part of that just supplementary because I have seen some um, instances in the town where we see some larger trees felled or even woodlots felled in new developments where there probably was an opportunity to keep that as the dedicated green space um, mm -hmm. or even or even parkland within the development as opposed to placing the park somewhere else but just keeping the existing environment as it was mm -hmm. well I, I will I mean my opinion is that we're not going to promote removing natural space um, to do anything other than serve its purpose if anything it's almost impossible to recreate that in a new park system it's, it's taken a millennia or so to get to that point as, as an ecological system, and you can't replicate that easily. So it, it's really important for the, um, the sustainability and resilience targets that you have as a, as a place to ensure that your natural areas are conserved and protected and expanded upon. Councilor Harrison Mac target to you, but I was just going to look to the director for a comment, please. Uh, further uh, to Councilor Cox's through Mayor Norcross, I'd like to mention that uh, Parks and um, Recreation and Culture is going to be undertaking a Parks, Trails, and Open Spaces master plan that will feed into all of the MCR official plan work. So when you're developing communities, you can have strong parks, open spaces, natural areas, and trails for that whole connectivity piece. So it supports the whole concept we're going with um, with respect to the urban design guidelines. Thank you, Director. Councillor Harrison McIntyre. Um, there was a picture in there of a low impact development um, parking lot, which has paving stones and moss or grass growing up between it. Um, will this guide be a tool for us to expand upon? that in our community and have more LID and smaller stormwater management ponds? Is this the tool we've been waiting for from the development perspective? Because I, I, as uh, Bruce knows, I've been asking about this for eight years. Um, I, I, I hope it's a tool to help you move in the right direction. But we, we have prepared um, green infrastructure design standards for other municipalities. It's a more detailed technical effort to make happen. But if you never put it in front of people who are bringing f projects forward, then um, it doesn't have much teeth. So we, we definitely promote the use of LIDs and green infrastructure. Uh, in every instance, whether it's in the public right of way, within park systems, within parking lots, on private sites. So we will write guidance around that. But to um, count the, the earlier question from the councillor about um, the, the, some of the outcomes of this, if it's not a guideline, we may recommend an action. And one of those actions is you, you should develop a more detailed green infrastructure tool that staff can apply on projects so that you can rely on best practice from other places 
but if you have specific stormwater management targets that the region is establishing or the province, you need to have a way of, of actually delivering upon that. So it could be a, a simple document. There's a lot of, um, there are a lot of resources out there. It is something potentially staff could pull together as well. But uh, the urban design guidelines will provide a certain level of guidance, but this more technical guidance, you may need something uh, of a finer scale. Thank you. Um, just to touch on what the director said, because I, I believe parts of Bill 23 is the requirement from the developers is actually going to decline for new developments and the amount of parkland that's required and the amount of money that they have to pay. Um, and their, the restrictions are, I guess they're going to become less on the development community than what they are today. So that would be our struggle is, is, is how do we put the teeth into it to make sure that we enact it. So that was great. Thank you for those, those comments. Any other questions of the presenter from members of council? Not seeing any. I'll refer back to you, sir. Is that our presentation? That that is it. I mean, I, I'm okay. I have a one final slide, but it's just telling you what I'm going to do next. So we have no problem with that. But uh, no, no, no. I mean, you obviously were very thorough in what you did, and you explained it so that uh, you know everybody got a really good grasp on on, on what's happening. I, I think you can see there is enthusiasm around the table here that mm -hmm. you know we're, we're looking for something to happen, and we want to make sure that we go ahead. You know, and you're right. You can't just produce a document. You got to be able to enforce it. You got to be able to enact it. And you know, you stretched and you stressed that a few times. So, um, you know, that's certainly very, very important. So, if I don't see any other questions or comments from members of council, I guess I would look to you to go to your final slide, please, sir. Okay. This is it. We're going to get busy over the next little while in the drafting of of this guideline document. We will um, again publish our engagement report that gives everyone a, a good idea of what we've heard to date through the various engagement activities. Um, but the, the plan right now is to get into production and develop the guide itself. So that is something that you'll be seeing in the coming months. And thank you. No, thank you very much. And Director, I just want to ask you one more question because I understand what Councillor Cox said. If you got a 10-acre natural bus forest, but I mean, there was the time, there is the time where we could say, we want that park to be there, but is it Bill 23 leading it more towards the development community will have a, a greater say in where they put that park? Um, th uh, we're or? still monitoring that, but the developer will have more say into what lands they find acceptable to consider for parkland dedication. And so we're gonna be looking into that more. But with the uh, Parks, Rec, and Culture undertaking that master planning exercise, especially for, uh, you know, setting the principles for new community areas and existing communities, that will really help establish what we want our parkland trails and open, like natural open spaces to look like and work with um, what we want as a positive outcome for community building. Well, thank you for clarifying. Thank you for getting out in front of it. Because I, I know it's very fluid. Things are changing very rapidly. So if there's no other questions or comments um, of our presenter, as I look around the horseshoe, I'm not seeing any. Uh, Brent, I want to thank you very much again for coming today. It was a very informative uh, presentation. Thank you. So we have a recommendation that report number PD-2023-17 be received. And further, the presentation of Brent Raymond in regards to the review of the town's urban design guidelines be received. Moving to seconder, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Harrison McIntyre, all those in favor, and that's carried and adjourned that the community home work meeting adjourn at, I say, 2.58. And I would then look to Councillor Rappin, would you move that? Councillor Cox, you would second that? All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much again. Thank staff, you. thank you very much, Council. And we're adjourned. Thank you.